One of the foundational texts of modern mathematics is Dedekind's 1888 monograph, Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen? One of the first systematic treatments of infinite sets, and it's the basis for what's now known as piano arithmetic. Now, as you might be able to tell from my pronunciation, I'm no expert on the German language. Uh, but what I do know is that the question was sollen doesn't quite translate into English. The title is usually rendered as what are the numbers and what are they good for? But sonen, like its English cognates shall and should, makes a bit of a stronger demand. Why should there be numbers? What purpose do we have for them? In order to come up with the best and most correct definition of a mathematical object, in this case the natural numbers, we ought to consider what kinds of things we'll be using the natural numbers for. What are the numbers and what are they good for? Anyone who's ever done research and tried to get funding for said research will be familiar with having to answer this kind of two-part question. What are you studying, and why should we care about it? If you're giving a presentation and your audience doesn't understand what you're saying, that's a fixable problem. But the really terrifying prospect is that they might fall along with everything, and then at the end be like, so what? Part of doing original work is always being on guard for this question, so what? Homotopy type theory is a bold new vision for mathematics, logic, and computer science. And history teaches us that the more radical and comprehensive your idea is, the greater need there is to have a good answer for, so what? So before we can get into Vassind homotopy type theory, we should take a good look at Vassolin homotopy type theory. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jacob Newman. I'm a PhD student studying type theory at the University of Nottingham. This video is the first of several planned videos I'm making as a side project covering the basics of homotopy type theory. My goal here is to provide you as much intuition and motivation as I can for these topics I cover, and hopefully give you a sense of wonder for what I think are some really cool ideas. These videos are very loosely based on the textbook Introduction to Homotopy Type Theory by Egbert Reicha and the accompanying Agda formalization, but I'm going to be straying from them in various ways. And I'll also draw from the hot book, so that'll also be a good point of reference. I hope to make these videos relatively self-contained, but I am going to be assuming a certain level of mathematical maturity, and I will be drawing on motivations and examples from mathematics and logic and computer science, so it'll be helpful to have some background in those areas. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. One of the main virtues of homotopy type theory, or HOT, is its dense interconnections to other fields. This is a point we're going to return to a lot. But it means that the question, what is HOT good for, will have a lot of different possible answers, depending on what kinds of things you care about. But one compelling use case comes up when we look at what's going on in the world of mathematics. Mathematics is, at heart, a social activity. A mathematical result is only truly considered legitimate when the relevant community of experts is convinced of it. Until you write it up and get it accepted by other mathematicians, a great mathematical idea is just an idea. As mathematics has gotten more and more complex across the centuries, this means it sometimes takes a lot more explanation to cover a given topic or to prove a particular theorem. It's not unusual for textbooks to be hundreds or thousands of pages, and sometimes it takes hundreds of pages to prove a particularly difficult result. And these are not pages of light prose. A single page can contain a huge amount of detail and very complex argumentation. Therein lies the problem. If someone comes forward with a lengthy proof of a major theorem, think like Fermat's last theorem or one of the millennium problems, then the mathematical community has no way to know if that proof is true besides having a bunch of experts meticulously poring over it. This can go wrong in a couple ways. First of all, the reviewers could simply miss some mistakes and erroneously sign off on a faulty proof. The reviewers are, after all, only humans. The more details their minds have to keep track of, the greater chance there is for missing a subtle, but perhaps fatal, flaw. Another undesirable outcome is that the proposed proof could languish in a kind of purgatory, neither accepted nor refuted. 
An example of this is Mokuzuki's claimed 2012 proof of the ABC conjecture, which has so far not won the acceptance of the mathematical community, despite considerable effort to verify it. And even if everything goes well, any errors are caught and fixed, the proof is correct and gets accepted, the whole process required numerous highly trained experts to devote a lot of time and effort. So the question we ought to ask is, is there a better way? What can we do to make this process easier and more robust? It turns out that there is an answer to this question. To see what it is, we need to take a detour through the branch of computer science known as type theory. As it happens, type theorists have figured out how to solve a simpler version of this very same problem. To see what problem type theory solves, let me do an example in the programming language Python. Let me be clear, I do like Python, and it's good for a lot of things. But there is one key shortcoming of Python, which hopefully this example demonstrates. Okay, so let's say you work at a nuclear power plant, and your job is to adjust the core temperature of the reactor. So in order to figure out how much to adjust the temperature by, you run this Python script. And so you get some reading from control panel D, whatever that is, and you enter it into here and it tells you how much to change the reactor temperature by. So for example, if, temp if control panel D tells you a factor of 11, then it'll tell you to increase the reactor temperature by 33 degrees. If you give it 13, it'll tell you by 39. You might be able to guess what the algorithm is already. However, if you enter a big factor like 16, then maybe the it's getting rather hot and so you don't have to in increase it by that much. So it only, only tells you to, to increase it by six degrees. So a simple little script. And so if we look at how this script works, basically what it is, is it asks for the reading from control panel D and then it takes, it passes that, that factor into a function called reactor temp factor. And so reactor temp factor, uh, if, it's, if its input n is greater than 13, then it returns 2. So as we saw, if the, if the factor gets big enough, then it just levels off at a certain point. Otherwise, it just returns the, its input. And so then it takes that, it takes the output of that, and multiplies it by 3, and then tells you to increase by that much. Simple enough. But what if I made a very small little error? What if I accidentally put this two in quotation marks? Maybe I'm you know, new to the working with this IDE or something like that, and I just make a little mistake and uh, put that in there. And so now if I run this code, it appears to maybe work the same. So if I put in you know, five, then it tells me to increase by 15. If I put in 7.5, it tells me to increase by 22.5. If I put in, I don't know, 13, then it tells me to increase by 39. It seems to be working the same. So go ahead and ship out the code and send it off and put it into production at the nuclear power plant. But there's a problem here. Uh, what if the reading from control panel D is 14? Then what happens is it tells me to increase the reactor temperature by 222 degrees Celsius which is way more than it ever would have. And so if you're an unscrupulous employee, you see like, oh yeah, the computer says increase it by 222 degrees Celsius, and so I do that. And well, um, doing the wrong thing with a nuclear power plant might be, might be bad. So this, uh, this 222 degrees is definitely a bad, bad outcome. So what happened here? Uh, why, why, when I just made this small little change, why did it go from working relatively normally, where it would just, if I gave it a big factor, it would just say, it would just say six degrees. Why did it suddenly start recommending 222 degrees when I made just a slight little change? And so the reason is it has something to do with how Python works. So what's happening here is when I put two in quotation marks, that's no longer the number two. It's what's called a string, which you can think of as just a bit of text. And so it's not the number two, 
it's the character to. And so what Python does is it allows you to multiply strings by numbers. So if I start a Python process here, I can do, you know, three times four, and it'll give me 12. But what I can also do is three times hello, and it'll give me hello, hello, hello. And so that's what's ultimately happening in this in this failed nuclear script is that it's taking this string two and multiplying it by three, which is why it said two, two, two. So there's kind of two problems here. First of all, Python allows us to multiply both numbers and strings, which is kind of a weird thing. And as we can see, it can lead to errors. But the real problem is that this reactor temp factor function here, sometimes it returns a number, n, and sometimes it returns a string. That's ultimately the source of our problem here. This example may be a little contrived, but the issue it highlights is very real. When your programming language is undisciplined about different kinds of data like this, it becomes substantially easier to write weird, buggy code. And this can cause huge problems. So what we want is a way to catch this kind of bug long before it's capable of causing a nuclear meltdown. The standard response to this is just to test your code more. Try out a bunch of different inputs and configurations and verify that the output is always correct. But this is kind of a band-aid solution. It relies on us being able to predict everything that could possibly go wrong and explicitly test for it. That's easy for a simple little function like this, but when you're dealing with millions of lines of code, it's not so easy. And if this code is responsible for preventing a meltdown, we'd like to be a bit more sure in our code. This is the problem that type theory solves. When working with a typed programming language, we insert a step into this pipeline. We require the code to be approved by a pedantic little robot called the type checker. The type checker does its job before the code is ever actually run. In the biz, we call this compile time and runtime. The type checker doesn't run tests on your code. It doesn't run the code at all. Rather, it just looks at the code and makes sure that you don't commit any type errors. A type error is a certain kind of bug where you're improperly mixing different kinds of data. So to see what the type checker does, let's take a look at this reactor temp factor example. So this was the, the correct version, the one that actually worked. And this one does not contain any type errors. And so in order to verify that, here's what the type checker does. It's going to break this whole program phrase down into smaller terms. So n is a term, n greater than 13 is a term, 2 is a term, n is a term, etc. And then what it's going to try to do is it's going to try to assign each term a type. And the type says what kind of data it is. So in this example, this is our input n. And so we said n is going to be a number. So I'll use this green color for numbers. So it's going to say, OK, n is a number. And we know n is a number, number. And we also know that 13 is a number. All right, good so far. And then. Here we have a comparison, n is greater than 13. And so n greater than 13, that's a, a term in its own right, but that doesn't have type number. That has a different type, which we often call Boolean. Now, Booleans are the kinds of things that can be true or false. In this case, n, n greater than 13 is either true or it's false. And then we look at this term 2. 2 is a term of the number type. And so we can see with this function that it takes in a number and then either way, regardless of whether that number is greater than or less than or equal to 13, either way it's going to return a number, either 2 or n. And so this, this whole program type checks because it always has a consistent return type of the function. And so the type checker would approve this code. 
Contrast this with the bad example. So again, we have n is a number, n is a number, n is a number, 13 is a number. We also have, again, that n greater than 13 is a Boolean. But as mentioned before, this 2 here is not a number. It's what's called a string. And so this is why the type checker would reject this program, because sometimes it's going to return a string, and sometimes it's going to return a number. Now again, the type checker doesn't actually run the code, so it doesn't know if the input passed in here is going to be greater than or less than 13. And so it has to consider all possibilities. And when it does that, it sees that, that we have an inconsistent type here, and so it's going to reject this code. And that's the gist of it. Requiring our code to type check and programming a process to perform the type checking will allow us to catch type errors in our code before our user ever touches it. This allows us to be much more confident in our code. But okay, so how does this relate to the problem of really long mathematical proofs? How is this a simplified version of that problem? There's one aspect of the type checking process which bears emphasizing. The type checker was a computer. If we had to type check all of our programs by hand, that would quickly become unmanageable and we'd be back to square one. But thankfully, type checking is the kind of thing that can be done automatically. When building the type checker, we just had to give it rules for deciding whether a given piece of code was well typed or ill typed. Okay, so here's the main idea. What if we were able to design a programming language with a super fancy type system? So fancy, in fact, that every theorem of mathematics could be represented as a type. And where proving a theorem is just programming a term of that type. So then, if your code type checks, that means the proof is correct. It's a bit of a crazy idea, but it actually works out. To see that, let's take a look at an example. So, normally I'm going to be using a theorem proving language called Agda, but today I'm going to do an example in another, a different language called Lean. So the result I have proved here is commonly attributed to Gauss, and I've even heard it called the kindergarten formula um, because of some apocryphal story where he came up with this proof when he was in kindergarten. Basically what it says is that if I sum up all the numbers from 1 to n, so 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n, then that's going to be the same thing as n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And so I've written that statement here as a type in this language. So that's exactly what it says is for all n that are natural numbers, if you sum up all the n, then that's going to be divided by 2 of n times n plus 1. And so this, this one that I have written right here is actually a term of that type. And so currently this piece of code type checks because I have correctly proved the theorem. But if I mutilate this theorem a little bit, and so it's no longer correct. Notice that I get this red squiggly line here, and Lean says something about tactic failed their unsolved gold goals or whatever. And what that really means is that this doesn't type check, is that you promised me here a term of this type, that uh, of this type, of the, the type that we're trying to prove. And what you've supplied is not that. It can tell that this does not type check and therefore my proof is incorrect. And this is the essence behind interactive theorem proving or theorem proving in a computer language is you let the type checker check whether your proof is correct. So this is a rel relatively simple example, but it shows basically how this idea works. So this is how type theory solves our mathematical proof problem. If a mathematician writes their proof in a language like Lean, then Lean's type checker will try to type check it. If the proof is correct, it will type check. If it's incorrect, Lean will find the error. 
This avoids all the problems we had earlier with having humans read and verify the correctness of their proofs. The type checker won't get impatient, it won't get tired, and it won't make mistakes. It won't miss minor details, it won't go back and forth for years trying to decide if the proof is correct. This task is simply better left to the machines. So it's for this reason that it's increasingly common for mathematicians and computer scientists to accompany their papers with a formalization. Basically, they still write their arguments in a natural language like English, as they always have, so their human colleagues can read and understand it. We call this an informal proof. But then they also translate the results into a computer language, producing a formal proof, so a skeptical reader can verify that it type checks and is therefore correct. So what's the catch? This all sounds too good to be true. Well, there is one main obstacle. Writing proofs in a computer language can be a lot of work. In any significant work of mathematics, there are tons and tons of tiny details. If you're writing an informal proof for human readers, you can gloss over a lot of those details because they're obvious. But to satisfy the type checker of your proof assistant, you have to explicitly formally prove every last claim. For instance, on the kindergarten formula proof from earlier, one of the lemmas I had to prove was that for every natural number m, m plus m is equal to m times 2. If I were writing for a human, I would assume they knew and believed that m plus m equals m times 2. I wouldn't have to prove it. And so unfortunately, a lot of the work of formalization is this kind of unsexy lemma-proving slog. This of course can be alleviated to a degree by collaboration. The main computer proof assistants out there have vibrant communities working together to develop standard libraries of basic theorems. But there's a deeper issue here. A lot of the mathematics is just not well suited to formalization. When I first brought up the idea of expressing every mathematical theorem as a type in a programming language, I hope you were skeptical of that idea. There's a lot of mathematics out there, and some of it is pretty far removed from the world of programming and type theory. Formalizing stuff like how addition and multiplication of integers works is straightforward enough. But try writing down the properties of 15-dimensional hyperspheres or fractals or space-time manifolds in type theory. It's a lot harder. A good example of this is homotopy theory. Homotopy theory, which predates homotopy type theory by several decades, is the study of how hyperdimensional spaces can be structured. Classical homotopy theory is a strange world, uh, full of unfathomable shapes and mind-bending propositions. But in the late 2000s and early 2010s, several researchers made an absolutely stunning realization. The crazy world of homotopy theory actually operates on the same logic as type theory. They endeavored to write that logic down and dubbed it homotopy type theory. What is this realization good for? Well, homotopy theory was a field that proved relatively difficult to formalize. This was a shame, because it's here that formalization is most sorely needed. Reasoning about 4 and 5 and 6 and n-dimensional shapes is really hard. You can't picture things in your head, you can't draw pictures, and you can't necessarily rely on your 2 and 3-dimensional intuitions. So the possibility for making subtle mistakes in your proof is all the greater, and it often takes a lot more mathematical machinery to capture such strange beasts. But if homotopy theory is type theory, then it's much easier, even straightforward, to write all this down in a computer proof assistant. And it goes beyond just homotopy theory. It turns out that homotopy type theory provides a really excellent language for pretty much all branches of mathematics. It's an extremely flexible and expressive language, and given its type theoretic nature, it's always amenable to formalization. Thus was born the Univalent Foundations Project, the idea that homotopy type theory could replace set theory as the foundation of all mathematics, the lingua franca of all mathematicians. In the videos to come, I hope to elaborate more on this central analogy between the theory of spaces and the theory of types. 
We'll also throw into the mix another stunning analogy called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which unites type theory with logic. As we build homotopy type theory from the ground up, we'll see how we can play with these different perspectives, spaces, types, and logical propositions, motivating new constructions and giving new meaning to old ones. In the end, I hope you'll see that homotopy type theory is good for a great many things.